Thanks, guys. If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, turn with me to John chapter 1. If you don't, the Scripture will be on the screen over my head or in the back of your bulletin. Have you ever been in a situation where you just, you just don't know what to do? Maybe your life has taken a turn that you never expected. Maybe you were placed in a setting or a circumstance that, that you just never had any experience in. Have you ever just felt that? You just don't know what to do. Well, if you are a Christian today, I think this passage is going to reveal to us that no matter where we are, at least one thing that God has given us is the knowledge of what we are to do. And if you're not a Christian yet, I actually think that this text has something to say to you as well, an invitation uh, to bring you. And so that's what we're going to look at in in John chapter 1 today as we continue our series uh, through the book of John. We're going to start reading the text in verse number 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, and Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. Now, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. One week. Life can take a dramatic turn in just one week. One week earlier, the family was gathered. It was a big party that was being thrown. Everybody was happy. There was a bunch of excitement that was going on. Little did they know that just a few hours later, the chest pain would be serious. And even though they did everything right and they rushed him to the hospital as quickly as possible and the, uh, the doctors and the nurses did everything that they could, little did they know that just one week later they would, that same family would be gathered in a somber tone in the ICU room making the decision to pull the plug. One week. One week the family was gathered after church and everything was good and they were having a great time, a quiet lunch afterwards before the chaos of the week would pick up. They were beginning to plan what next year's vacation would look like and dreaming in the hopes of, of, the, of, of the wedding anniversary that was upcoming. Little did they know that in just a few hours the emails would be found and that foundation of that relationship that was so certain would suddenly crumble. And just one week later, that same family would be gathered around the same table, but instead of a happiness and a joy and excitement of what was to come, there would be a somberness and a silence and an uncertainty of if they would even be together by the anniversary. One week. One week. Everything had led up to this, all their training, all their excitement, all their dreaming, all their savings were on the line. The product was going to launch the next day, the nervousness that is there, the uncertainty of what would take place. Little did they know that one week later, the success that they would have, the pressure that would come with that, and and one week later, they would be gathered around, whereas a week before, they were wondering, will this make it or not? One week later, they're gathering around trying to figure out, how are we going to keep this success from killing us? Life can change in a week. And some of you know that far better than I do. It's interesting, John's gospel, we've said before that that we're like the jury, and John is now the prosecuting attorney making the case that Jesus is in fact the Son of God, that you and I should believe in him. And, And he begins his gospel in the first 18 verses with what is called the prologue. It's the opening statement in which he is laying out the issues that we're going to see within the book. But then from that moment, John makes a a decision of how he's going to arrange what he's about to write. And he chooses to actually leave out uh, two of the most important stories, in my opinion, to the early aspects of Jesus' ministry. Uh, Because his space is limited, his time is limited, and and in coordination with the audience that he's trying to reach, John chooses not to tell the story of of John John the Baptist baptizing Jesus. It's a powerful story. He talks about John the Baptist, but he kind of leaves out the the narrative of the baptism. Uh, But then he also chooses to leave out what is one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible, the temptation of Jesus, where Jesus goes out in the desert and experiences temptation in much the same way that you and I experience the temptation. And it shows us his humanity while at the same time showing us how to overcome those temptations that come our way. John chooses to leave that out. 
And instead, as he is now making the case that Jesus is in fact the Christ, the Son of God, he he chooses instead of of telling those two stories to to just take the first week of Jesus' public ministry and to recount it. And and so from John chapter 1 and verse number 19 uh, into chapter 2 and verse number 12 or 13, that is one week. And so the week kind of climaxes in in this day six in which nothing happens, which prepares us for the action of day seven, the story we're going to look at next week, where Jesus does his first miracle, his first sign, in which he turns water into wine at this insignificant wedding in Cana of Galilee. The week begins with this very dramatic picture as John the Baptist is now following, has this great following coming toward him, and he chooses and he sees Jesus and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And basically, he tells his followers, This is the one that we've been waiting on. This is the one we've looked for. And so, in day one, he has that own experience. In, in, in day two, he has a personal experience with Jesus himself. And then, days three, four, and five of this first week of Jesus' public ministry, We see Jesus calling his first disciples. And so John has two followers of his own. And there is Jesus. And John tells them, hey, that's the one you're looking for. You don't want to follow after me. You want to follow after him. He's the one that we've been waiting on. And one of those disciples is Andrew. And so Andrew goes back to his home and he gets his brother Simon. And he brings Simon to Jesus. And Jesus invites him, and he says, come and see what this is all about. And as they do, uh, Simon decides he wants to be a follower of Jesus. And Jesus looks at Simon and says, from now on, your name was Simon, but from now on, I'm going to call you Cephas, which we translate Peter. It's one of the most ironic moments in the Bible to me, because he looks at this man, and he says, you're going to be the rock. And we have a concept of what the rock should look like, right? We have a rock in our day and age, right? I mean, that's what the rock should look like, Right? I mean, kind of, you know, kind of like me, kind of strong, <laughs> tall, stable, in a questionable career. You know, kind of like me. All right? So we would expect Peter, the rock, to be this unmovable force, this emotionally stoic person that you can always lean on and turn to, and he, was always, he should always be the one that, that brings stability to the group. And yet that wasn't Peter at all. Peter was the roller coaster. He was the up and down one. He was the one you were always having to pull back from from making a fool of you at the bar. Hypothetically, if the disciples were at the bar. But anyway, you know, they're evangelizing there. And so getting communion supplies. And so you'd always have to hold Peter back because he was going to get you in a fight with everybody else. Everybody has a friend like this, right? Peter, how is he the rock? It's this great irony, I think. It's almost like calling Manute Bull Manute, Right? If you're a kid, ask your parent what, or Google it, Wikipedia. Come on, get, a, get, a, get, a, get an idea of what we're talking about. Manute Bowl's really tall. They call him Manute. I almost think Jesus said, hey, your name's going to be Peter, and then winked at everybody. Like, this guy's not going to be stable at all. And yet, why is Peter called Peter? His stability comes not in his own personality, in his own response, or in his own actions. His stability comes in the fact that he's the first one that says, as a disciple, you are him. You are the Christ. It brings a great deal of comfort to me to know that Jesus so often identifies us not by our own actions or our own mistakes, but by our belief in him. Peter was known as the rock, not because he was a rock, but because he believed in the stable message of Jesus Christ. Life is flipped upside down. And that's very possible that Andrew then, <clears throat> then went to kind of his hometown where he and, he and Pete were from and, and brought Philip into Galilee. And the text says that, that Jesus then finds Philip and, and he looks at Philip and he says, hey, follow me. And, and Philip chooses to. It, it's this great, to me, this great narrowing down of what it means to be a Christian. In our society, people use this word Christian in so many ways. It can be a political affiliation, almost, a, almost to some extent as, as an ethnic kind of affiliation. It can, it can almost be in, used interchangeably, sometimes wrongly, uh, interchangeably with the idea of being an American. We use this word Christian so often in so many ways. So many people call themselves Christians that know nothing about Jesus. Maybe a greater definition, maybe a greater tagline would be, I'm a follower of Jesus. That's what it truly means to be a Christian. To be a follower. 
And that's somebody who, who desires to live a life like Jesus has called us to live, who, who, who has based all of our hope and our trust in him, who understands our own depravity, our own inability to, to do anything right, and now has based our entire lives now on Jesus himself. And because of his great love for us, now we follow and we obey and we do what he says, not with perfection, but even in the midst of our own mistakes, we humble ourselves, we feel that conviction, and we come back to him and ask him for his grace. We experience his love. What it means to be a Christian is to be a follower of Jesus, Christ is that you today? Not are you a Christian, but are you a follower of Jesus? Do you desire to live the life that he wants you to live? Do you desire to obey him? Do you desire to learn more about him, to understand more about him so so that whenever situations or circumstances come your way, you will seek to do things his way? Is that who you are? If so, you're a Christian. If not, if you're just a Christian by, by name and affiliation alone, if you're just a Christian because you think you were born into, into a church, you walked an aisle, or you got baptized, or you said a prayer, or, or, or you were christened in some way, if that's what you think your whole hope of being a Christian is all about, then biblically speaking, you know nothing of Jesus. A Christian is one who now follows after him. Now, I, I love the simplicity of this. Because wherever you are today, if you are a Christian and you don't know what to do, do this. Just follow him. Just wherever you are, in whatever situation or circumstance you're in, just follow him. If you're a student and you're nervous about this next school year, maybe you're going to a new place or a new school and new friends with new teachers and you don't know what to do, just follow Jesus. Just as you walk in that first day, just follow Jesus. Know that he loves you, that he's concerned for you, that he can, he can arrange the situations and circumstances of your lives, that he sees you right where you are. Don't be surprised and walk into that school, walk into that place and know that he loves you. Just follow him. Maybe your marriage is falling apart and you never you thought you'd be in this place all by yourself, all alone, and you don't know what the future holds. Well, just follow him. In, in this new season, in this new setting of life, and in, in an uncertainty of what is to come, just follow him. If, if the diagnosis might be coming this week, if you had the test on Friday and you're supposed to get the results on Monday and you don't know what that's going to hold, then either way, make the decision right now that no matter what's going to happen, that you're going to follow Jesus. A Christian always knows what to do. We, don't, we may not know the specifics of what it means, but the task before us is always the same. We're called to follow Jesus. This morning, Matt's preaching this in Greenwood. Who knows this better right now than him? He he didn't think that a month ago when we were planning out this series that his son would be right in the middle of chemo treatments at the age of 11. We didn't even know yesterday when when Will spiked a fever and he ended up in the ER. I didn't even know last night if Matt was going to be able to preach this morning. And, And the backup plan was either drag Shelton off the bus which wouldn't have been a good idea. Or for me to preach your first service, go to Greenwood, then try to get back, which y'all kind of like, because what if I don't make it? Oh, I'm sorry, we're out early, right? And so last night as we were texting back and forth, Matt and I were texting, I just said, hey, we'll make the best decision when we can when we get there. We're just going to follow him. We're going to do the best we can and just going to follow him. We hired a Greenwood pastor, and this morning he's in Atlanta telling his church family that he's moving to Greenwood, Arkansas. He grew up in Atlanta. All his friends and family live in Atlanta. He's got three little kids. Uh, and whenever I say little, I mean one of them is a seventh grader. What are those kids to do? Having grown up around grandparents, grown up in, in this little place in the south called Atlanta, and now coming to Greenwood. You know what they're called to do? To follow Jesus. To trust that Jesus is going to take care of them wherever they are, and in the midst of that situation and circumstance, God has at minimum allowed them to be there, if not made them to be there, and then in that moment they can bring glory and honor to Him. That is what a Christian does. That is what you and I are called to do wherever we are this week. However life changes when we don't expect it, just follow Him. And so that's what Philip does. And then Andrew goes and, and Philip goes and gets Nathaniel. And notice the pattern that's happening here. And notice the pattern of how Jesus draws people to himself. And now it's possible that he just saw Philip and just called him, but chances are that Nathaniel had a role in that. But in every other instance throughout the book of John, you're going to see people coming to Jesus, and every single one of them will be brought by somebody. 
somebody becomes a believer in Jesus and they go get a friend and they bring him. And that person becomes a believer in Jesus and they go get a friend. And that person becomes a believer in Jesus and they go get a friend. Do you see the pattern that happens here? There are people in your circle today. If you are a follower of Jesus, there are people in your circle who are going to come to know Christ, but they're not going to come to know Christ until you bring them. You are going to be the conduit that God is going to use to bring them to himself. If God has transformed your life, if you're amazed by his grace, then one of the byproducts of that is you will want to tell other people about it. Not about the greatness of you or your own decision, your own choices, but the glory of what God has done for you. And so that happens. And so Philip goes and gets Nathaniel. And he says, hey, Nathaniel, we have found the one that Moses was talking about. We have found the one the prophets were talking about. That Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel goes, did you say Nazareth? And notice the response of Nathaniel. He says, what good has ever come out of Nazareth. Nathaniel's a skeptic. You interact with him all the time. Some, some of you might be in this room. A skeptic of, this can't be. And for Nathaniel, is the idea of, yeah, I believe we're waiting on one, but there is no way he would ever come from Nazareth. It's kind of an ironic statement because Nathaniel came from Cana. And next week we're going to look at Cana was not exactly the metropolis of Galilee. Cana was as insignificant as any town. And so here you have the small town guy saying, I don't believe the Messiah has come because he could never ever come from this other small town. Now it could be what's going on there is just the limited thinking that we tend to put God in a box. And we tend to limit God of what he can and cannot do. And we just assume he will move the way we expect him to move. And so they expected the Messiah to come from Jerusalem or at least from Rome or Athens. Sometimes one of the toughest things in convincing a small town that things can happen there is not convincing outsiders. Sometimes it's convincing insiders. That God is so powerful, He can work. Sometimes it's one of the great struggles that we have. We we can think of ourselves as so insignificant, and we are insignificant, but, but God is significant enough that he can use us. And all that has to happen is for us to come to this understanding, not to look at our own situations and circumstances, our own communities, our own insignificance, but instead to understand the power of God that he can work in you. But just as he can work in you, he can work in that neighbor of yours that you think is worthless. So here's Nathaniel. And that could be what's going on here. It's just a little small town rivalry. Right? I mean, I mean, imagine. I mean, this is the equivalent of somebody coming to us and saying, hey, we found the Messiah and he's from Mississippi. Really, God? Mississippi? Cana and, and, and Nazareth were, were kind of competitive. It, it might be similar to, to, to Greenwood and Alma. You, you know, around here, north side and south side, we compete with each other, but we love each other. We root for one another. I mean, I want Northside to win every game, right, except for when they play Southside, right? And for the last decade, it's been gone great. And, um, yeah, so suddenly new life has all these people going over. I don't know what's going on. Uh, but, you know, Greenwood and Alma aren't that way. These small communities, they can't stand each other, right? Nearly every year when they play in football, somebody will call me and say, hey, you know what your church members are doing? I'm like, no, I can only guess. <laughs> Can't you do something? You know those people over there in Greenville, you know those people over there in Alma? Not only do they want to beat each other whenever they're playing, they want the other team to lose every game they play, right? It's just a small-town rivalry. And and so with Jackie and Matt preaching this sermon today in Greenwood and Alma, how they're telling the story differs, right? The Messiah comes from Greenwood if you're in Greenwood. (laughs) Comes from Alma if you're in Alma, right? And so it could be this rivalry is going on, but whatever is the case, Nathaniel doesn't believe. He's skeptical. And yet he has a skepticism that is still wedded with a humility. He's still open to the idea. And notice what Philip says to the skeptic Nathaniel. He doesn't try to argue with him. He doesn't try to berate him. He doesn't try to belittle him. He doesn't try to play a moral high ground card with him. Instead, when Nathaniel shows a skepticism, Philip just says, hey, well, why don't you just come and see? Using the exact same words that Jesus had just used a, a, a few verses earlier in calling the disciples of, hey, why don't y'all just come and, and look it out? Just check it out. Just, just see for yourself. Hear the message. See who Jesus is. And, and get your own opinion. And this is a great approach, by the way. You know, so often what we want to do when somebody doesn't want to believe in Christ is we want to try to beat them up. We want to try to beat belief into them. 
You don't need to do that because it's not going to work. And so Philip just says to Nathaniel, hey, why don't you come check it out? And if Nathaniel says no, then chances are Philip moves to the next person and says, why don't you come check it out? Uh, but instead, to Nathaniel's credit, he says, okay. And, and I love this type of person. I love the type of person that has the intellectual honesty to say, I'm not there yet. To say, I'm not a believer. To not bow to the social pressures of just saying, yeah, I'm a Christian, so they'll leave me alone. But instead, to be honest to say, I don't believe, but to then have, still have an openness of their own minds to say, uh, but what's going on? Let me understand the message. I love that concept. And those are the, I'll be honest with you, a pastor isn't supposed to say this, I would much prefer a humble unbeliever who, who's open and understands that they could be wrong, who's willing to discuss, uh, than a really arrogant believer. I mean, I'll see you in heaven, but I really don't want to see you here, right? Put that on the Hallmark card. <laughs> I'll see you in heaven, but I don't want to see you here. Here's a casserole. But there's just something about, about the honesty that's here. And he says, okay, I'll come and see. And so they begin to walk to Jesus. Now think about this. They're walking to Jesus, the creator of the universe, the one who ultimately will die for them, the love that's going to be overwhelming and amazing. They're, they're going to see the VIP, right? And as they're still a little bit of ways off, you can think that Philip's thinking to himself, how am I going to introduce Nathaniel? Right? Like, how am I going to make this happen? And, and maybe Nathaniel's starting to get nervous because even though he doubts, uh, Philip, he trusts Philip, and Philip says, this is the one. And so he's thinking, maybe he is the one. So what are going to be my first words to him? And then while they're still a ways away, Jesus calls out and says, behold, uh, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And Nathaniel goes, is he talking about me? And Philip goes, I think he is. And Nathaniel has no clue what he's talking about in the same way that I have no clue what he's talking about. What does that mean? Behold an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. I don't, what does that mean? I mean, it sounds like a compliment, right? I mean, I mean it sounds good, but, but I think in part, and maybe this is just me reading, maybe this is me thinking Jesus is more like me, which he doesn't need to be, but, but I almost can hear this as a compliment that's also a dig at somebody else. Behold an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. We finally found the one. As compared to you Pharisees and Levites. As compared to this whole nation of Israel who has a long history of deceit, of, uh, of being God's chosen people, but then going after a thousand different idols. I, I mean, this literally could be like the equivalent of me yelling out, Behold the LSU fan who is humble. Like, we finally found him. Tell your friends and family. It's a compliment to him, but a cut down to everybody else. And Jesus, because isn't this what Jesus is doing? Jesus calls out to Nathaniel and says, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. He sees within Nathaniel an honesty, a, a pursuit after God, even though he doesn't know who God is yet. He can see something within him. And Philip calls out, I mean, Nathaniel calls out and says, how do you know me? I, I love the engagement here. Don't miss it here. I, I love this order of engagement. Uh, last Sunday night, we, we, we gathered to honor Coach Roland, great man of character, athletic director here in Fort Smith for a long time, just a, a great man. A, a gr he's done a great deal for our community, been a tremendous leader specifically over these last couple of years. And so we, honored to, we gathered to honor him, and, and there was a VIP event because some of the senators and coaches came in to, 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 to speak. And so I was at that VIP event uh, because Jackie's wife couldn't go. Um, and so I wasn't, I wasn't invited. Uh, Jackie was emceeing the event, and he called me up and said, hey, Cedar doesn't want to go. Do you want to go? I'm like, yeah, I'll take your ticket. That's fine. And so, and, and so I went to the VIP event. So we're in a small room, and there's VIPs around, right? You're supposed to meet and greet. Well, I, I like being there, but I don't like the events. You know me well enough to know I, I'm very introverted, except on stage. I'm very introverted, and, and so I just don't like that. If, if you want to talk to me, I'll talk to you all day long. But if you don't want to talk to me, I'm not going to make you take a selfie with me, Right? And, and so I just, I hate those events as far as that goes. I love seeing people. And so I walked in the room, I'm kind of uncomfortable, and you know, everybody else, they're breaking through the lines to get the pictures and all that. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. If they want to come talk to me, I'd love to talk to them. What? 
Now, that makes no rational sense, right? If the VIP wants to come talk to me, I'd love to talk to him. Like, that's ever going to happen, right? But imagine if it did. Imagine if you were going to an event, and the person that everybody was gathered to see, the moment you walked in the room, if they came to you, one of my favorite stories, my, my friend Marcy, uh, was whenever she was uh, in politics here locally, she got to know President Clinton, and uh, then at the time, Governor Clinton, and they got very close, and and then the governor went away for eight years. He had some things to do. And so uh, he went, um, he, <laughs> that's a funny joke. I'm not going to go there. He went away for eight years. And, um, and so um, at the end of his presidency, he was flying back into Little Rock. And during those eight years, uh, Marcy went through a great tragedy in which her son was serving in the military and died in a training accident. And, and she suffered that. And, and then her marriage came to an end as well. And um, and, and so they're going down. She and a friend is going down to, to welcome the president back to Arkansas before he'd leave again. And so they were going down to, to welcome the president back into Arkansas. And as they're driving down, Marcy said to her friend, I wonder if he'll remember my name. You know, it's been eight years. He's met a few people. I wonder if he'll remember this, this little person from Sebastian County. And so they get down at the event, and, and she doesn't even know maybe the president is in the room yet when she hears a, or she feels a tap on her shoulder, and she turns around, and the president looks at her and says, Marcy, I'm so sorry about your divorce. Well, I don't know how he did that. It's maybe somebody whispered in his ear, I don't care. Imagine how Marcy felt in that moment of the care and the compassion and the concern from this person who had other things to worry about, and yet he was worried about her. You know why I love Jesus? And the sermon's not over yet, but do you know why I love Jesus right now? <laughs> it's because God himself has initiated contact with us. Literally, we are in the room of his world, here gathered to worship him, and we are arrogant enough to go, well, I'm going to wait to see if the VIP comes and sees me. And then he does, and he calls you out by name. And so there doesn't have to be any nervousness. If you want a relationship with God, there doesn't have to be any nervousness of what will my first words to him be? What will my introduction be like? Because God himself, while we will still, we're still far off, is calling out to us, calling us by name. He knows you. He hears you and he sees you. And so Jesus calls out to Nathaniel. Nathaniel says, how do you even know me? And Jesus says, well, hey, do you know whenever you were under that fig tree? I saw you. Well, what does that mean? We don't know for certain. We know in Zephaniah 3.11, don't turn there in your Bibles because you wouldn't find it, but we know in Zephaniah 3.11, we know that there the fig tree makes reference to, to kind of home. And so chances are what's happening here is that Nathaniel had had a moment with God at home, in private. Nobody knew about it, and yet he had had this moment. Maybe it was a moment like you've had before. Maybe it was a dark night, and the grief was overwhelming, and he didn't know if he was there or not, and you were crying out to him. Maybe it was a, just a moment of tremendous prayer in which you felt his presence, even though nobody else was around, you just felt his presence. And, and maybe just for a glimpse, you felt whole. We've had those moments, many of us in this room. Maybe it was a moment of uncertainty. And you were crying out to God to say, God, do you even exist? And yet you remember it. Nobody else knows about it. Jesus, in that moment, looks at Nathaniel, who had had one of these experiences and he says, Nathaniel, Nathaniel, I saw you then. And Nathaniel, in response to that, says, you truly are the Son of God. You know what I think heaven's going to be like in part? I think Jesus, is, at times, is going to sit next to me and say, hey, Kevin, do you remember? Do you remember that night you were so scared and you were calling out to me? Do you remember that night you were so uncertain about what the future held and you were praying to me? Do you remember about that moment at camp, that moment in worship in which you felt just enraptured in my glory? Oh, I was there. And I was listening. And I was watching. And I was with you. And I think beyond that, Jesus can go more in-depth and he can begin to recall and recount situations and circumstances that I've long forgotten about. And he could say, Kevin, you don't, you don't remember how afraid you were as a seventh grader? 
And yet you were praying this prayer, and here's what you were praying, and here's how I answered that prayer. And oh, Kevin, you don't remember what it was like in the midst of that loneliness, and you were crying out to me for friendship and companionship, and here's what I did for you. And oh, Kevin, you've, you've long forgotten about this situation over here, but I still remember because it was a meaningful moment for us. In part, heaven will be God himself recounting to us all the times we thought we were alone, all the times we were uncertain, all the times in which God felt so distant, he will reveal to us that all along he was right there beside us. He loves you. He loves you with a love that you and I can't even begin to imagine. He loves you with a compassion that we can't even begin to fathom. He loves you in a way that still sees your sin and loves you anyway, and that love is going to be made manifest to us in heaven, and a day is going to come in which every doubt will be wiped away, every tear will be wiped away, and we will be one with the Father in that moment. And just for a second, Jesus says, oh, Nathaniel, I saw you. And Nathaniel says, you must be the one. And yet notice Jesus' response. When somebody comes to faith around here, we high-five, we celebrate, we baptize, we hoop, and we holler. But notice Jesus' response. Nathaniel says, surely you are the one. Look at what the text has to say in verse 50. Jesus says, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? Some people read this as Jesus almost being exasperated. Like, it really took a sign for you to believe, but I don't take it that way. I take it as almost a mature kind of humor. And what Jesus says, almost with a laughter, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? <laughs> Just wait till, wait till you see what comes up next. And Jesus, almost with a sly smile, says, Oh, you're going to see greater things. You're amazed at me because I saw you in private. How are you going to feel when I change that water into wine and give you a wink? You're amazed because I know a little bit something about your past. How are you going to feel when you see me strolling across the water? You're amazed that I can know that? How are you going to feel when the winds and waves die down at my voice? You're amazed that I call you? How are you going to feel when the little boy is healed when I'm from a distance still away? You're amazed at me? How are you going to feel when Lazarus himself comes back from the dead? Oh, you're going to see greater things, Nathaniel. I have not shown off here in this moment for you. I have not tried to amaze you just to cause you to believe in me. This is just who I am. This is just what I do on, on a common sixth day. It's not a big deal. What you're about to see is a big deal. You see, Jesus said, Nathaniel, you're about to see greater things in chapter 1. And just 20 chapters later, in John chapter 21, the disciples are out on the boat. Their Savior had been crucified. Their entire future was up in the disarmed. And in that moment, they're fishing and they can't catch a thing. They could not be any lower than they've ever been before in their entire life lives. They had risked their lives to follow Jesus. He is now dead. So they go back to their old professions and they get no luck whatsoever when suddenly some stranger from the shore calls out and says, cast to the other side. And they're so desperate in that moment. Well, we might as well cast to the other side. And all these fish begin to come in. And in that moment, the disciples knew that must be Jesus. And Peter in that moment, in almost a Forrest Gump, Captain Dan kind of way, just dove in and began to swim toward the shore. While the disciples were having to gather all these fish, they begin to row the boat ashore. Hallelujah. And once they finally got to the shore, Jesus has a fire built. And he says, hey, give me some of those fish that you haven't even caught till I show up, even though this fire has been burning for an hour. And I'll put them on here for you. And the resurrected Jesus that you saw crucified will now cook you breakfast on Nathaniel. This is nothing what you just saw. And oh, you and I think that we've seen things. If Jesus has ever moved in your life in any way, if there's ever been a moment that has given you chills, if you've ever felt a connection to God, if you've ever felt that it's all worth it, Jesus in his love is looking down at you and me going, oh child, you ain't seen nothing yet. But you won't see unless you follow in faith. And if you follow, you will believe. And when you believe, you will see. And what you see at first will not compare to what lies in store for us. Are you a Christian today and you don't know what to do? Just follow him. Are you not yet a believer today, still a skeptic and you don't know what to do? Come and see. For what you will see will rock your world. Would you bow your heads and pray with me?